Hello, this is John Griner with Basin Safety. Excited to be here with you this month, November 2020. We're going to be covering a couple topics, defensive driving, awareness training, and cold weather work and safety. We're also going to be discussing a little bit about cold weather injuries, how to prevent those injuries, and how to take care of people from a first aid perspective if somebody gets an injury. So this is a little bit of a longer month, a lot of topics, a lot of information here to cover. Hopefully it's going to give you the skills you need to prepare yourself as well as manage any sort of emergencies that arise in the field due to any sort of automobile crash or cold weather work issue. So we're going to go ahead and start with defensive driving awareness training. I just want to point out right away in this picture that if you are letting your children drive your vehicles, uh, that is very dangerous. This, this kid is a terrible driver. You can tell he's not looking at the road, can't even see over the dashboard. I think this is some sort of Humvee. Definitely not, should not be driving a Humvee, just, just so we're all on the same page there. Want to make sure no one's letting their children drive their, their Humvees. No, actually, uh, family is one of the major reasons for us to be safe on the road. Um, during work, a lot of us aren't driving with our families, hopefully. But there are a lot of people that are uh, getting out and about, especially in the cold weather season for Thanksgiving, uh, for Christmas, for New Year's. And, and we'll look at some statistics this, uh, later on in the, the presentation here that kind of show when those, uh, those incidents happen. And we want to make sure that uh, we're protecting ourselves as well as other people on the road at all times. So our goal is to provide information and skills to perform tasks involving driving safely, efficiently, and with minimal risk to yourself and others. That's kind of the main goal here is obviously protecting yourself and other people. We're also going to be talking about some regulations, statistics, and corporate requirements for your companies, making sure that you don't drive distracted, etc. So defensive driving, as uh, defined by the National Safety Council, is driving to save lives, time, and money in spite of surrounding conditions and the actions of others. Maybe something you want to pay attention to for the quiz a little bit later. And that's, you know, everybody, myself included, has moments of road rage, of issues on the road, of, of being frustrated with others, or the conditions, uh, construction specifically, where you're just kind of tired, you're fed up with it, you want to get to where you're going, you have a job to do, and we don't always account for the things on the road. And that's one of the, the big things we need to do is before you set out, especially if you're going an hour or longer, just anticipate there being issues on the road, it taking longer. And, and a good way to prevent that is by leaving earlier uh, than, you, than you think you may need to, especially when road conditions or construction may slow you down. So it does obviously save lives uh, without skills and experience to avoid preventable collisions. Um, accidents happen and about two thirds of all collisions are preventable. I may even say it's a little bit higher, but statistically that's, that's the reality. So saving your own life is a big thing and the, the techniques we're going to be talking about are simple, easily learned. They definitely focus heavily on knowledge. Uh, foresight, alertness, judgment, and skill, as well as patience, cooperation, and courtesy, and not having a me versus them attitude. That's extremely important uh, when you're out there on the road. So drivers that exemplify good habits, um, they have knowledge, foresight of what could potentially happen, alertness, judgment, and skills. And if you've ever had to train a driver, especially a young driver uh, out there, how to, you know, how to, how to drive, <laughs> you you recognize the lack of experience very quickly and how that can uh, make them stress, make them frustrated, or make the, uh, kind of push them to make bad decisions or not the right decision. And that's why it's important, obviously, to have somebody there training you. And then as you get older and you get more experienced, you start to know that, hey, well, you know, if somebody cuts me off, it, rather than riding up on them, it's better just kind of tail back and maybe give them a little bit of a dirty look when you drive by. No, I'm just joking about that. But, you know, you, you know that you don't need to win every battle on the road, and there really isn't any battles on the road. And defensive driving, really, the, the mentality here isn't to be a, a, an afraid driver at all, but it's to maintain your integrity and your safety on the road, uh, regardless of what other people are doing. So patience, cooper cooperation, and courtesy on the road, once again, not a me versus them attitude. So defensive driving saves time, but not necessarily on the road itself. You know, honestly, if you uh, leave a little bit earlier and are a little bit more cautious and give other people the right of way, that may 
uh, extend the length of your journey. However, obviously, if there's an accident or if you get pulled over, as many of us have before, you know that you know getting pulled over definitely does not uh, get you there faster. So obviously, time from grieving, away from work and recovery, etc. So automobile crashes are definitely expensive. Uh, there's a multi-billion dollar automobile insurance industry for this reason because injuries happen, hospital bills happen, uh, collision repair and maintenance repair uh, issues happen. And so, you know, part of this too is taking care of the vehicle that you're driving. We've got about 10, 15 trucks on the road uh, every day. And, you know, we can tell the difference between people who are taking care of the vehicles and people who are not taking care of the vehicles. So obviously, you know, uh, in my experience, people who don't take care of the vehicles, it just costs a lot more to keep those individuals on the road. As far as the attitude goes, um, as I mentioned earlier, it this is this is something that you choose. You have to make a conscious decision to choose to be a safe driver. It doesn't just naturally happen. No one no one gets cut off or sees someone driving insanely and is you know thrilled by that or uh, calmed by it. In fact, it naturally makes us upset, and that's where we have to kind of choose to have a good attitude about. You know, people on the road and other people uh, driving inconsiderately or driving unsafely. And your attitude, if you get stressed, you get frustrated, you get angry, is going to quickly uh, turn into bad driving habits. And road rage, uh, as many of us have felt at one time or another, myself included, uh, is driving on the, under the influence of too much anger, abrupt anger, or constant anger. And, you know, you, you can see nice little old ladies uh, get behind the wheel of a car and just turn into a tear. And, uh, you know, it, it's not uncommon. Um, in some ways, maybe it's a stress reducer. I don't know. Uh, but we definitely don't want to use our time in, in the vehicle as our uh, therapy for life. So if you are behind the, the road and you're, you're ticked off and you're angry, you got a long drive ahead of you, probably not the best time to be driving you know, take a calm, take a calm, deep breath and just let it go. So another thing that exacerbates this is feeling endangered, uh, in danger by someone else who cuts you off, uh, is tailgating you, um, swerving in the road, etc. cetera. Um, other things being forced to slow down or being upset with someone who's, uh, you know, breaking traffic rules. Uh, and here we have the, the term righteous indignation, which definitely categorizes uh, how I feel sometimes when I see people doing that. Uh, but, you know, really, it's okay to have all those thoughts and feel all those feelings. I'm not telling you how to think or feel. But if you let that control you and you don't, you know, let it go and just calm yourself, you can exacerbate it further and cause a bigger issue. And it's interesting, you know, in the last few years, there's been a lot of uh, just videos and obviously with YouTube and everything um, blowing things up, but drivers getting out and fighting each other, people shooting each other on the road. Uh, in Detroit a couple years ago, uh, uh, someone was prosecuted for um, someone was driving in the fast lane and in Michigan, if you've never driven there, it's, you know, people really make use of that fast lane and someone was just kind of putzing along in that lane. Eventually they got over and a driver got into the fast lane to the left side and actually shot them and killed them on the road, uh, which is pretty insane. Uh, we think, man, that's, that's next level road rage, but you know, uh, letting that kind of stuff frustrate you or over frustrate you really isn't in anyone's uh, and I'm not saying anyone here is going to shoot somebody for driving too slow in the fast lane, but uh, it's not going to really benefit anybody, especially yourself. So five major factors uh, that include that influence the driving performance. We have maturity level, people's attention and alertness, uh, their knowledge base, as I mentioned earlier, just not having the experience, driving habits, uh, some things we do without even uh, thinking about it and if you really think back over a journey you know the different things that you do you know how many times did you look at your phone uh, how many times did you adjust the radio reach down for something uh, you know cleaning the dash on your car whatever it is these sorts of habits uh, over time consistently can add up cumul cumulative accumulatively to an incident or an accident and then lastly and I've already kind of went over this uh, pretty thoroughly our emotions and our attitudes so physical aspects, um, we've all experienced this as well. Fatigue, uh, illness, age, um, you know, either young or old without experience or just not fully alert. Uh, stress can definitely uh, cause issues. And then physical disabilities um, can, can you know, when they look at all the accidents that have happened and they kind of do a root cause analysis, that's another issue that they find. So major and common driving errors are obviously failure to obey traffic laws, 
uh, not following the speed limit, running stop signs, you know, driving under the influence of alcohol or other substances. Failure to maintain a vehicle is another issue, and this is typically with people who don't know a lot about cars. You know, they don't they don't uh, keep it in good conditions. The tires are running bald. Um, you know, the uh, whether it's the the engine oil hasn't been changed, which can cause the vehicle to break down, etc. Uh, discourtesy to other drivers or combativeness like hey you know I didn't make the high school football team so you know I'm going to take it out on everybody until I'm you know 57 years old uh, lack of driving knowledge just once again not knowing what to do in certain scenarios and then bad judgment in poor decision making and you know whenever I read that I think of you know people who have died um, or, or been seriously injured from like swerving to avoid squirrels or rabbits and you're thinking what were you thinking man you know like you know, you, you know, I, I love animals probably as much as the next guy, um, but definitely not enough to put my life in danger to, to uh, save a squirrel. But, uh, you know, people in those instances not having the foresight to think, hey, you know, what do I do if something jumps in front of me? Do I swerve maniacally uh, in order to avoid it at 70 miles per hour? Or do I just, you know, say, hey, sorry, buddy, wrong place, wrong time. So who has the right of way out there when you're driving? And uh, there's this, um, you know, it's a little bit unclear, you know, or everybody's not quite sure. The best answer to this question, and I know it's not easy, is they do. They have the right of way. You know, if, if, it's, if it's unclear, uncertain, wave them through. Uh, around roundabouts, etc. you know, it's unclear, it's unsure. Just go ahead and let them let them in if they, if they feel like they really need to get in there. And this is really where kind of like stepping up and being the better person on the road. It's a good place to practice that. And hopefully for some of us, it bleeds over into our regular normal life. But really, it's a, it's a good place to practice, you know, selflessness and saying, hey, these pre people have the right of way. So right away at intersections, obviously there are times when a driver must yield to the right of way. And knowledge of this is important. Um, sometimes, as we all know, four-way stops can be a point of frustration for me where, you know, Billy obviously stopped before me, but he's waving me on. And I'm like, why? Like, does your car not work? What, what do you just just follow the rules? You know, there's a little bit of road rage coming out there. on I me. Mean, hopefully I didn't uh, come through too harsh there. It's easy to get frustrated. Um, so obviously the person <clears throat> in a four-way stop, just to make this clear, if somebody to the right of you stops first, um, they go first. If someone across you stops first, they go first. If someone to the left of you stops first, they go first. <clears throat> if you arrive at the same time, that's when you know it depends on you know who's to the right of whom. And the reason for that is, <clears throat> you know, statistically, that person is not going to be in your way unless they're taking a left turn. And that's what you don't know at that moment. And that's why you want to give them the right away so that, you know, you don't hit them is kind of the, the major goal there. So when stopping, um, this, this is a little bit of a pet peeve of mine. If you stop behind a car and they stop at the stop sign, that doesn't mean that, oh, I already accomplished my stop. You actually need to stop at the at the line, at the red line or the white line, depending on the city you're in. And that's the place that you actually stop before uh, engaging uh, on your way. At railroad crossings, uh, these signs are called cross bucks. You see them. Um, there's different, you know, uh, situations you're going to see depending on where you're at. And rail accidents, believe it or not, they still happen. Uh, last year, there was a fatality in Montana near Culbertson. Um, a vehicle drove across the train tracks, and I believe they stopped, and they were hit by a train. Um, you know, uh, th there's deep culverts around a train and deep ditches around uh, railroad crossings typically. So definitely be careful on the ice, etc. But we'll talk about that a little bit more later. But, you know, this indicates, hey, um, this is a yield sign. It's not a stop sign unless you're a vehicle that's required to stop at a railroad sign. So if the red lights are flashing and the gates are up, you stop first, then proceed with caution, which can happen from time to time if there are gates. If the gates are down with no train in sight, you can't go around the gates. It's not like, well, you know, hey, you know, this thing's this thing's broken. I need to go around it. Um, there's typically a phone number on the box you can call. I mean, that's uh, typically that doesn't happen, but there is a, a phone number there you can call. And at a non-gated crossing, you must stop at least 15 feet from the rail closest to you if a train's coming. I mean, if there's no train, then go ahead and pass on through. But once again. Treat it as a yield sign. You definitely want to look down the rail as far as you can, not just in your immediate area and say, hey, there's no train right here. Because rail rail accidents still happen, believe it or not. 
some people ask why they don't just put railroad crossings everywhere. I'm not going to get into the financial reasons, but it does cost a lot of money. And actually, um, they do make a lot of money when there's when there's accidents. It's, it's something insane, like a million dollars a day or something, uh, billed to the insurance company. So I'm not saying that's the reason why, but uh, they, for whatever reason, financially, they don't put them up. So moving uh, into buckling uh, buckle safety, obviously the law, law requires for you know people in a vehicle to be buckled up at all time. Um, if you're under four years old, uh, you need to be uh, essentially in a car seat and restrained by a seat belt. Um, four to 17 years old need to also be um, using a seat belt. And no person younger than 18 may ride in the open bed of a vehicle or trailer unless it's the only vehicle owned. Um, that's a little bit state by state. Just don't put your kids in the back of it. I mean, if you're on a farm somewhere and you're moving from field to pasture, what? okay, probably fine, but definitely in the road. Don't be putting kids in the bed of a pickup truck. All right, let's just all kind of agree to that. So uh, crash, crash data does show a direct correlation between seatbelt use and severity injury. Uh, and um, not to say that if you're in a seatbelt, you can't get hurt or you can't die. Both of these things can happen, but statistically, um, unbelted vehicle occupants and crashes in North Dakota account for the largest percent of fatalities and serious injuries. While belted occupants most commonly receive non-serious or no injuries at all. So over the past five years, um, you know, it's a little bit uh, dated statistics here. Nearly six out of every 10 people killed in a motor vehicle crash were not wearing a seatbelt at the time of the crash. And 80% of the unbelted fatalities were males. So a lot of times, guys that are uh, uh, listening to this and, and watching this, you are the typical um, uh, people that aren't uh, buckling your seatbelt. So just kind of give an idea of what happens when you're uh, in a vehicle crash. So the force of an impact on your body. So at 25 miles per hour, it's similar to the force of a two-story fall. Just boom. At 40 miles per hour, it's a force of a six-story fall. And at 60 miles per hour, it's the force of a 12-story fall. Um, you know, personally, when I was a kid, we'd jump off the top of roofs. We thought it was fun. Um, you know, uh, we were young, buoyant, etc. Probably a couple broken legs out there. Jump our bikes, crazy stuff. Um, as I get older, you know, the thought of falling off of, you know, anything above like, you know, a staircase uh, scares the crap out of me. Um, but the uh, the a twelve story fall definitely not something anybody wants to experience. So just kind of note that that's the force of the body. And if you're not wearing a seatbelt, that force will thrust you out of a vehicle uh, through a window, through the windshield, etc. Um, and then, you know, it's not just going through the windshield that hurts you. It's that force magnified by the stopping force of the ground when you hit it. So this is another pet peeve of mine. Um, definitely had a couple experiences of road rage around this area is when people don't stop for sirens and klaxons. You know, you see a siren or a klaxon, pull over the side of the road. Don't, you know, try to make your turn or, or, or you know, uh, get, get ahead in the line or whatever. I mean, if you see it, it's definitely a part of the law. Um, so it, you want to give them a, a safe area to pass. You want to give them a clear road so they don't have to worry about potentially hitting somebody. And on two lane highways, especially, uh, this is, um, even if they're coming at you, you still want to pull over, give them as much road as possible. Um, some people do it on four lanes, not necessarily required if they're coming in the opposite direction, but who knows, maybe they need to, you know, come across the road where you're at and it's better just to slow down and stop, get over, get out of the way safely, uh, so that they can pass. So school buses, uh, when the warning lights are activated, this means the bus is preparing to unload. You definitely want to reduce to 25 miles per hour, which is kind of the standard school zone speed, and then prepare to stop. Like, you know, be looking for a reason to stop. If maybe the guy left the lights on or whatever, you know, slowly crawl by, but definitely be prepared to stop. If the red lights are flashing, the stop sign is out. This is an indication to stop whether you're coming uh, behind the bus or towards the bus. Either case, you stop. Watch out for the kids. Uh, prepare to, you know, let them, let them pass by. And if you get a, stay a couple minutes, once again, if you're practicing leaving a place early, then it's not such an issue. So definitely, you know, kids are going to be in the street if you see that stop sign. So in inclement weather, fog, snow, rain, wind, rain and darkness, there's a few tips and tricks that I want to, well, tricks is the wrong word, but a few tips I want to, uh, there's no real hacks for driving in inclement weather, but, um, you know, a few things you can do to protect yourself and uh, other people. So hydroplaning happens obviously when there's uh, uh, ice or rain on the water. And essentially it's when the vehicle um, doesn't uh, have traction because it's using the water as uh, its, its surface uh, to travel on. So 
under or overinflated tires can cause this uh, excessive speed, typically the culprit, uh, depth of water on the road, and lack of tread depth on your tires. So, you know, if, if you know your tires, uh, have, you know, are kind of near in the end, end of life and you're trying to hold on a little ways, a little while, and there's a heavy rainstorm, you definitely want to be prepared that, you know, you're going to hide your plane. The way to do this, the way to prevent this is to slow down. You want that vehicle, the weight of your vehicle, not to be in an inertia state, but more to be in a static state, uh, which is going to hold you to the ground better. But the faster you go, just like in a boat, uh, the more um, speed and frequency on that water you're going to get. Driving at night, more dangerous than driving during the day. Um, you know, there's not a lot of night driver training, but uh, there are a few different tips and tricks. So one thing is, you know, obviously, um, you know, wearing uh, some sort of headlights or excuse me, uh, eyewear that that blocks out the the headlights, which can help, especially if if you get night blindness. Um, there's different. Um, they're like blue blockers essentially, and you can still see at night and. Uh, they also uh, like illuminate um, a little bit better as well. So things to remember about driving at night, your headlights are only going to illuminate a certain portion of the road. Um, the speed you travel is going to eliminate reaction times and things are going to um, not get into your vision vision until much, much later. Um, you'll see them, you know, not a mile down the road, but literally a few hundred feet down the road. Uh, your peripheral vision is hindered. Uh, and then obviously, you know, Typically, we're going to get more tired when we're sleepy. There's not as much to engage us. And uh, obviously, driving while tired is a serious issue. So another encouraging uh, or, or thing I encourage people to do is just slow down and driving at night. In fact, Montana, if, if you travel a lot over there, you'll note that they have a nighttime driving speed limit. And that's you know essentially because they know that more accidents, more fatal accidents happen at nighttime. So backing, uh, typically not you know fatal accidents unless someone's behind you standing there, but uh, most accidents happen while backing. So you know trusting your rear and side mirrors. There's blind spots, not always a great idea. Even even backup cameras. You know sometimes you can get so fixated in that backup camera that you're not looking to the sides and things that you could hit there. Uh, before you get in the cab, great idea to do a quick walk around to ensure nothing's in your path. Just look around. Hey, you know. Um, I'm a little bit closer to that than I thought I was, or there's something behind my vehicle that wasn't there before. Back slowly, and then be careful of small children who may wander behind your car or truck, mostly in town. You know, if you're on an oil site and there's kids walking around your, your pickup truck, that's there's probably a more serious issue there. Uh, but then also always park so your first move is forward. So backing in, you know, all the major corporations that have large fleets of trucks, there's a reason that they always back in. Um, because most accidents happen while backing, you know, um, something dr gets in your path, uh, you can't get out as quickly. If there's an emergency, you know, you got to back up and three point turn yourself before you get out versus just driving straight away. So always park so your first move is forward. Physical forces that uh, influence driver control, just to get in some physics here, uh, 30 miles per hour um, and 3,000 pounds, small car, you need 78 feet, 78 feet to stop. At 6,000 pounds, so a pickup truck, you need almost double that to stop. Uh, when the weight doubles, the stopping distance doubles. So at 60 miles per hour, you need about 303 feet to stop. When your speed doubles, it's about four times the stopping distance as uh, 30 miles per hour. So you know, just just know that as your speed doubles, uh, the distance you need to stop uh, doubles, uh, or excuse me, quadruples, and then the weight of your vehicle as it gets larger, the distance stop, you know, the stopping distance you need uh, doubles. So, you know, if you got a vehicle that's loaded, you've experienced this, uh, it takes longer to stop. You know, it's just straight physics. Um, and obviously better braking mechanisms, air brakes, et cetera, these, these can, you know, help that process. But, uh, you know, inertia is inertia and you can't fight it. So how to, how to calculate the stopping distance of your vehicle at a speed of 60 miles per hour. It takes the average person um, 1.5 seconds to recognize an object on the road. And at 60 miles per hour in 1.5 seconds, you'll travel 132 feet before the brakes are applied. So, you know, j just think about that. That's about 30 yards, 40 yards. Um, which is a pretty good distance before you even start pushing the brakes. And then once again, how long you take to stop uh, depends on the weight of your vehicle uh, and how good your brake system is. So getting into North Dakota statistics, uh, they do a great job putting this online. Uh, if you're interested, there's a lot more on there. I kind of did a brief review here, but uh, kind of going over the last decade. Um, so in 2009, we had 17,000 crashes, um, and which has actually gone down now, but for a while there, it peaked up significantly, as you can see in the graph down there. 
Um, and now that 2018, I think 2019 was a little bit lower as well. You know, we're down to about 15,000 crashes. So and 105 fatalities in 2018. So just note that, that, you know, um, the fatalities are a factor of how many accidents there are. So when you had 18,000, uh, fatalities in 12 and 13, you had 170 and 148 fatalities. So a lot, the same thing in 2011. You know, once we get down there, the 17,000, 15,000, you see them closer to about 100. So, you know, those two, two things do correlate uh, very clearly. So in the nation, you know, there's 33,000 fatalities a year, and 100 of those are in North Dakota uh, to 2018. So North Dakota uh, vehicle fatalities by month, 2018. So if you look in the winter months, you know, January, February, December, November, um, there are actually not as many uh, typically in the winter months. You'd think there'd be more, but people are driving a little bit more carefully. Um, the majority of the fatalities are June through October, and then they start to, to, to go down there in 18 anyway. But over the last uh, decade, you can see once again, you know, August, July, uh, September, October, and June, and even into May are kind of our higher months. November is up a little bit high. December is up a little bit high. January is typically a lot lower. Uh, in February is a lot lower. And by that time, people have gotten kind of more experienced than, you know, driving in the winter um, or speeds are slower, et cetera. So, you know, definitely, you know, we're, we've kind of made it past the hump, if you will, for risk. Um, but, uh, you know, still November, a lot of fatalities in December, a lot of fatalities. So, you know, this is, um, this is, this, these are real people, you know, and, and when we see these numbers, you know, you, Everyone says they don't want to be a statistic, but obviously here we don't want to be too. Just know that there are still a lot of people uh, dying on a consistent basis from driving unsafely and not wearing their seatbelt. So by county, I've kind of highlighted some of the main oil field counties here. Um, this is in 2018. So, you know, if you look at 105 fatalities in North Dakota uh, in 2018, uh, you know, you look at... Uh, Seven of those are in McKenzie County, seven in Montreal, 10 in Williams, three in Stark. Uh, in Ward, you got seven. I didn't highlight that one. Richland, seven. So, you know, that's where a lot of most of the fatalities are happening are in oil and gas countries, but, or areas. But then Cass, which is, you know, uh, the population of the entire western side of North Dakota, there were only 10 fatalities. So just looking at it statistically, you know, Williams County has maybe 35,000 people. Cass County has like 120, and we have the same number of fatalities. So it just shows you um, a lot more people on the road, a lot heavier equipment on the road, and it statistically does make you more likely to, to get in an accident over here. And 307 injuries in Williams County um, and Cass, over there you got 1,111. So, you know, um, to 1,000 uh, crashes in, in, in Williams to... Uh, in Cass, once again, our most uh, populated uh, county, 4,000 crashes. So much fewer crashes here, um, same number of fatalities. It just kind of shows you that speed on these, you know, a lot of, lot of faster uh, roadways up here, um, speed has a, a big impact in fatality levels um, versus smaller, you know, fender bender type crashes. So how do we rank nationally? Um, you know, like I said, in 2018, we had, you know, 105 fatalities. Um, fatality rate 1.06 in North Dakota and U.S. fatality rate 1.14. So, you know, we're a little bit below average there. Uh, we have been above it, though. You know, in 2014, we were 1.2 to 1.8. 2013, 1.4 to 1.1. 2012, 1.7 to 1.1. So, you know, we've definitely done a lot in the last, you know, five years to, to bring those numbers down statistically, but still uh, quite a few fatalities. So, um, you know, Kind of calculating the stop and distance of your vehicle, we already went over kind of went over that a little bit. So we're going to talk about effects on traction. So friction is obviously um, we're relying on the, on the the tire uh, tread to uh, have friction against the road to stop us. So the condition of the brakes, tires, the road surface, and speed all kind of come in uh, to affect the friction of our our vehicle on the road. Um, on traction, which is a little bit different, that's obviously having control, that friction actually being strong enough to hold, uh, is felt when you're, you know, centrifugal force is felt when your car is being pushed away from the center of a curve when driving around a turn or corner. Um, a lot of accidents around uh, curves um, out there, and you'll see it sometimes where, you know, uh, at the end of a you know curve, you've got, you've got like a, a, a road barrier there uh, to protect. Typically, they don't put those out uh, preemptively. They put them out after so many vehicles have crashed off of the road. 
Hydroplaning is another one. I kind of talked about that a little bit already. Uh, something that we experience on the road. Yeah, that's when your your vehicle uses the water as a surface, and then you have no traction. You have no friction because uh, tires on water have no control. So obviously, you know, lower speed prevents that from occurring. So um, once again, friction is the gripping power. Traction is affected, you know, essentially affected in one way uh, or another by fraction, by friction rather, stopping distance, centrifugal force, or hydroplaning. And whenever you decrease the traction of your vehicle on the road, you increase the likelihood of an accident. Um, in the winter time, what can happen as well, which which we should talk about, um, slippery surfaces, etc. Um, oil. The, you know, when you see like a light snow falling, especially right away at the beginning of the, of the winter, and you see this kind of like black, these two black lines that, that kind of surface on the road, uh, that's actually the oil that's on the road coming to the surface on top of that snow or frost. And that's essentially going to be the most slick area on the road, but typically people drive right in it and it looks safer because it's like, oh, here's the dry spot. That is not the dry spot. The road is completely covered. I promise you it's not just missing those areas, but that's actually oil and grease and tar, uh, which can um, uh, decrease friction, especially if there's ice on the road. So kinetic energy, centrifugal force, inertia, and gravity. Kinetic is is you moving, centrifugal force is you staying, um, you know, on the center of the road. Inertia is is the movement of you moving forward, um, you know, and, and then trying to stop. That's your inertia, and then gravity obviously is another big player in this. Which you can reduce the amount of gravity you're experiencing by speed. So um, inertia, as I mentioned, uh, the force or factor that makes objects remain in place or at remain or uh, remain in motion. Kinetic energy is the energy of motion. Um, the, the faster it travels, the more difficult it's going to be to stop that kinetic energy and your inertia. So those two kind of work together. Uh, gravity is obviously what pulls you towards the Earth itself. Um, and then for those reasons, essentially there's there's a simple um, tip here to prevent the likelihood of inertia, gravity, all these things affecting you getting in an accident. So we've all heard of the two-second rule, which is like if you're driving – and there's a vehicle in front of you on the roadway, You want to, what's the safe distance between them? And typically the safe distance is you see them pass a mile marker, telephone pole, and you're going to count 1, 1,000 to 1,000. And that's you know, going to give you essentially a good stopping distance in between you and them. Um, that's in dry, perfect, perfect road conditions. Once we you know, get into wet weather, uh, we want to double that to four seconds. If there's snow on the ground, we want to double it to six seconds. And if there's ice on the ground, we want to double it to eight, double, you know, increase that by another factor of two to eight seconds. So if there's ice on the road, you should not be traveling as close to a vehicle as you do uh, when it's dry. Just plain and simple. That's that's not a good idea. You want to be much further behind them so that you give yourself ample time to stop and stop slowly. If you slam on the brake uh, brakes when it's icy, you're going to skid out of control. And then if someone's coming head on, um, you're going to have or, or you know either head on in a two lane or head on in a four lane. You definitely can cross that that um, barrier and go into the other lane or under the uh, way of traffic. So if you haven't driven a road before, you know typically we're going to naturally drive slower depending on what kind of driver you are. Um, I have a good friend I drive with a lot, uh, and she just knew it doesn't matter. We were driving through South Dakota the other day. She'd never been to South Dakota, and she's driving like she grew up on this road. You know, the speed limit's 70. She's going a little bit over 70. I'm like, what are, you, what are you doing? You don't know this road, and we're in the mountains. You know, so some people just have that mentality. So, uh, you know, uh, definitely if, if you're the passenger, hold your drivers accountable to uh, travel the speed limit or below if necessary. At Basin Safety, we have a permanent five miles per hour under speed limit regulation. So you cannot drive the speed limit. It's not acceptable. You have to be five miles under because, you know, things happen. You end up going a little bit faster. You're going down a hill, whatever. You're going to hit that speed limit. But as a rule, we're five miles per hour under. So um, if you have a longer hood, you're going to you know travel a little bit further because we're going to travel uh, closer to the vehicle, depending on how much we, we see of the road. And so you just keep that timing, um, timeline and distance, uh, timeline and distance in mind, and then kind of have that be your internal mental buffer for distance between you and the vehicle in front of you. It's a great idea. So once again, kind of wrapping it all up, failure to obey the law, failure to maintain your vehicle, discourtesy to other drivers, combativeness, lack of driving knowledge, and bad judgment and poor decision making. These kind of all culminate into root factors of a lot of automobile accidents and fatalities. 
So interacting with pedestrians on the road, obviously they have the right of way. You know, some people don't have this mentality. They're like, you're walking, you're, you know, in dumb area. I'm going to make you pay for it. Uh, no, just let them, let them go. Give them a little wave, not with the middle finger, you know, but just, you know, let them, let them just yield to that. Um, sharing the roads with trucks. Obviously, if you are a truck driver, you know the importance of this, but definitely don't get into their, I think they call it the no zone. Uh, in driver training these days, you know, essentially they're blind spots. You don't want to be there for very long. Um, so as much as possible, avoid those blind spots. Uh, trucks are bigger, so plan and start your pass earlier if you have to. Give the truck as much distance as possible. You know, once you get in front of them, don't cut them off. Don't make them slam on their brakes. Uh, if a truck's getting out of the way, take the ditch. You know, get it or the shoulder, get out of their way because, uh, you know, they have a lot of weight behind them typically. Cyclists are required to obey, obviously, other traffic laws. They don't always, you know, slow down when you're passing by bicyclists, especially if you have a bigger vehicle. You know, you're, um, the, uh, the wind created by your vehicle or the air um, gusts when you're driving past them can cause issues and cause them to crash. So definitely give them a little bit of space. For motorcyclists, um, they're also required the same rules, obviously. Signal and execute your maneuvers earlier when you're around motorcyclists. Definitely increase your following distance and be very careful at intersections. You know, motorcycles can typically stop a little bit faster. Not that it's safer because they're lighter. Um, so that's another thing to keep in mind. Like, hey, if this person slams on their brakes and they have to stop for a lot more things than a car does, you know, a motorcycle may need to get out of the way of a rabbit um, uh, just for safety. So, you know, smaller things can impact their ability to travel safely. So keep that in mind. So if someone is coming up behind you and there's a threat of a rear end collision, so I make a habit, if I am if I have to stop faster than normal, especially for whatever reason, I'm always looking at my rear view mirror. And there's been probably half a dozen times where I've you know stopped completely and then pulled over because there's a car coming up way too fast behind me. Um, so, you know, obviously give them a little bit more uh, traffic distance. If you have to, um, you do not want to be on the brakes when you're hit. You want to um, potentially, you know, put it in even in neutral, but definitely release the brake at the instance before hit because that rather than force completely coming into your vehicle, it's going to propel you forward, you know, rather than your, your, your vehicle trying to hold you back. So and that's also going to prevent you from skidding out very hard as well. So, you know, always when you're stopping or especially when stopping fast, take a look in that rear view mirror. Make sure nothing's coming uh, up behind you too fast. All right. So if you're in the winter and which we will be very soon and kind of already have been, um, if you get into a slide, um, what's happening is one of your vehicles has lost traction with the road and it's either spinning or locked up or whatever. And it's whenever a, 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 a tire or a part of your car doesn't have traction it's it, and it's weighted on that, it's going to want to move to the front of the vehicle. So especially if it's a rear tire, that's a problem. That's why rear wheel drive vehicles are so dangerous. So, um, if it's front front wheel, you know, it's already at the front, so it's a little bit better. But once you start skidding, if, if the, the tail end of your vehicle is, is swinging to the right side, you want to turn your wheel into that or to the right side. Essentially, you're balancing out that skid and you're, you're preventing that tire from moving the way that it wants to because you're counteracting its swing to the front of the road. The same thing to the left, you're, you're skidding to the left. You want to turn into that so you're counteracting uh, that, that tire's ability to swing to the front of the vehicle. So don't slam on the brakes. Don't pump the brakes. Let off the gas for sure um, to, to reduce your speed because that will increase the lack of traction if you are continuing to give it gas. So if you have a flat tire blowout or loss of a tire, the best thing you to do is hold it as steady as possible and slowly you know, let off the gas and slowly kind of maneuver to the shoulder of the road. Um, you know, once you have control, so steer straight until you're in control and then pull off, uh, the right of the way to stay, uh, safely stop mechanical failures. If your brakes fail with standard disc brakes, a lot of us don't have that. Uh, but you want to pump them and try to build up enough brake fluid pressure to stop the car. Most of us are going to have anti-lock brake systems at this point. Um, so obviously press down hard and hold the pedal. Uh, don't pump your brake pedal. It's not what we want to do. Um, and if possible, shift to a lower gear and apply your foot hand parking brake if necessary. So if you have, you know, automatic, uh, gear shifters, um, or you're in a manual, you don't want to gear down. That's going to slow down your speed, uh, get your engine reducted a little bit. And so that's what you want to do. If your brakes fail, get your vehicle, you know, use other means to, to slow your vehicle down. 
Mechanical failures of the gas pedal sticks, concentrate on steering, keeping your eyes on the road, attempt to lift the accelerator with your foot, do this with your toe, do not bend down to lift the pedal with your hand. If these measures do not work, hit the brakes hard, shift the neutral, pull the e-brake, you know, um, brakes do fail, gas pedals, uh, you know, fail. I mean, there's a lot of recalls because of uh, floor mats getting in the way of the brakes, etc. So this can happen. So just be prepared for it. Uh, loss of vehicle power while driving, not as much of an issue, obviously, except for people can hit you from the back. So don't turn off your ignition as it may lock your steering wheel, which would be bad. Uh, steer yourself to exit away from traffic. Um, it's going to be more difficult, but uh, you know, get out of the way of traffic as soon as possible. If your vehicle breaks down, once again, get over the side of the road. We're going to talk about what to do in the winter here in a little bit when we get into cold weather safety. Uh, but turn on the flashers, raise the hood when safe, uh, turn, turn on the car's dome light, let people know you're there. If you have road flares, I mean, maybe not necessary, but triangles, etc. You want to get as far away from the roadway as you can, um, and then be prepared for the unexpected. Steering failure. Uh, definitely ease off the accelerator, wait until the car slows down, then apply the brakes to avoid changing lanes or direction. Uh, bring your car to a smooth stop. Not a typical failure, but it does happen. All right, so lastly, got to talk about phone use, um, texting and talking while driving. Uh, texting is obviously a no-go. Uh, it's illegal. If you need a text for some reason, get off the roadway. Um, there's you know functions on a lot of cars nowadays with CarPlay, et cetera. You can talk into the vehicle system. Even that can be distracting if you got to mess with the console to do that. Uh, email viewing and sending, even GPS viewing. Uh, get off the roadway and move over the shoulder to a less busy approach to do so. Talking Bluetooth great if it's works. If you don't have Bluetooth in the vehicle, um, you know you can use speakerphone, etc. But uh, definitely avoid to try. It. And then other distracting uh, things such as eating, uh, writing down information, reading. Um, you know uh, probably shouldn't be reading novels on the road, etc. Watching movies, videos. You know definitely keep all that stuff uh, off and, and just pay attention to the road, which can be difficult. Um, some people uh, have taken to putting their their cell phone in the glove box. Uh, just because they, they, you know, they hear a ding, they naturally grab it. You know, it's just what you do all day. So in the vehicle, it's hard to men mentally say, okay, this is not an okay time to do that. So just keep that in mind when you're driving. Minimize distractions. Keep your seatbelt buckled. Uh, drive slower and then plan your route to leave earlier so that you're not in a rush to get where you're going, especially in winter months. So speaking of winter months, uh, cold weather work and winter preparedness, we want to talk about this. Obviously, working in the cold. Um makes life more difficult uh, if you have to work in the cold pumps don't work things fail they freeze up you need methanol uh, etc so these are some things that we want to talk about so we want to talk about cold weather terminology some precautions cold weather injuries what they look like how to prevent them and some different things you don't want to do in the winter so the cold stress equation, uh, when the body is unable to warm itself, essentially it stays cold. And when you stay cold, your body starts to develop hypothermia. Um, so there's different temperatures where this happens. Um, this is just kind of an ACGIH thing. Um, but essentially, you know, depending on the temperature and the wind speed, um, that's where we need to be concerned. So you know, looking down here at about um, you know, minus 20, that's where things can seriously happen within like a minute. Uh, minus 30, uh, minus 40, and minus 50, less than 30 seconds, we can ex we can experience um, frost nip, frostbite. So this is a, and then wind just uh, increases that. So here's the National Weather Service wind chill chart. I like this a little bit better. It's a little bit clearer. The other one, you know, you're kind of like, eh, how many degrees is that? Uh, this one's a lot clearer. So really, where we want to start uh, paying attention, you know, at at the lowest, um, at the, you know, at 55 miles per hour. 10 degrees uh, can hit us pretty hard and that's less than 30 minutes where we're going to experience some sort of frostbite so even you know at 10 we may not think it's that that cold especially if you're in north dakota but you know it can be so even at 30 degrees at uh you know 55 degrees uh, 55 uh, miles per hour less than you know two hours it's gonna take a little bit more than two hours rather but you know still you know even at 30 degrees we can have potential injuries but then as we get into you know a typical windy day in north dakota is 20 degrees 20 to 30 degrees is typical right so where we have to really start worrying is right there at about zero five to zero degrees when we see that and it's a normal winter day frostbite can occur in less than 30 minutes you know when, once you start increasing uh, the wind speed etc it can get it can get uh, get pretty quick. So, um, you know, it is not uncommon uh, for it to hit, you know, 60 miles per hour, 60 mile per hour winds in North Dakota. 
It's not crazy, although it doesn't happen often for it to get minus 45. But then we're looking at negative 100 degrees. You know, we're locking, you know, in, but it doesn't even have to be that. You're less than five minutes if it's, uh, you know, negative 30 with a 25 mile per hour wind, um, which is pretty common actually in North Dakota in the wintertime. So keep that in mind. Um, keep your skin covered, etc. And we'll talk about that a little bit more here in a bit. If you'll let me. So outlook, winter storm outlook, essentially three to five days before a winter storm. Pay attention to these. Doesn't always happen, but you know something to kind of pay attention to. Advisories. We have wind chill advisory, winter weather advisory, dense fog advisory, and wind advisory. So 30 miles per hour is when the wind advisory starts. So just know that if we're hearing about a wind issue, it's over 30 miles per hour. Most elevated work is going to stop at that point. So if you're working on a workover, et cetera, you probably shouldn't be working, even if it was a sunny day at 30 miles per hour. So wind chill advisory is 25 to 39 below zero. Um, so uh, that's really where our wind chill issues are going to start to happen, or 25 degrees above to 39 below zero. Winter weather advisories is an issue for combination events, snow with freezing rain, sleet or snow and wind with blowing snow when warning criteria is not expected to be met. So this, you know, typically 35 inches of snow, et cetera. Dense fog is when a widespread fog is going to re reduce visibility to a quarter mile or less. Now, once again, if you're traveling at 60 miles per hour, you see something in the road, it's going to take you 130 feet to, to, to start applying the brakes. And if you remember before that, it's going to take you another 300 feet if you're a truck to stop. So we're looking at 500 feet you know, a quarter mile is 800 feet. So if you were to see something at the end of your visibility and slam on the brakes immediately, you may not stop before you hit it. So just, and especially if there's any ice, et cetera, on the road. So dense fog advisory, definitely keep that in mind. So winter storm watch is affects the abilities possibility, or essentially alerts us of a possibility of heavy snow, a blizzard, heavy free, basically serious winter issues. And then once we get into warnings, that's, that's when we know it's happening. Like it's coming, uh, heavy ice accumulations of a quarter inch or more, obviously extreme dangerous and damning situations, icy roads, down tree limbs, power lines. You do not want to be around when a power line goes down. <laughs> Uh, winter storm warning issued when a combination of heavy snow, heavy freezing rain, or sleet is expected to occur. Uh, they typically are issued 12 to 36 hours before the event, but not always. And six inches or more of snow in 12 hours or less, or eight inches in 24 hours or less, is going to be a winter storm warning. Don't worry. Not going to put this on the test. Uh, I'm going to share a link uh, under the video here. There's actually a really good uh, a bit of material that Dan uh, Griffin with uh, Nesset Consulting shared with me. It's it's a, a Pembina County uh, a road uh, road and winter safety awareness packet. Highly recommend it, and that's where I got a lot of the information for this. Warnings: Blizzard warning issued for sustained or gusty winds of 35 miles per hour or more with falling or blowing snow, um, and it's going to last for at least three hours. And then wind chill warning uh, once again um, issued for wind chills of 40 below zero or colder. But as we saw on that, you know, wind chill chart, it doesn't take very, it doesn't have to be that cold for that to occur. All right, so another good tool out there. Um, is the North Dakota Roadmap app. So you can do this online or, or you can download the app. And it's going to give us road conditions. Um, if they're closed or blocked, you can look at cameras uh, around the county, around the state, kind of look, hey, I'm going to be driving over here. Let me click on this camera here and it'll show you the road conditions where you're going. You know, if you see high drifts of snow, be like, yeah, maybe I don't want to travel that way today. So, so it's a really good tool for just knowing what conditions you're going to be exposed to when you're getting out there on the road, you can plan your route by it and then just check to see if you want to send your guys out of the field that day as well. So the next few slides, we're going to be covering winter preparedness at home and in your vehicle, kind of the main areas we're going to be when there's issues. Um, so at home, you know, you want to have a, a good kit of materials and supplies, first aid kits, some extra food, medicine, water, uh, batteries, a radio uh, that's either solar powered or, you know, hand crank power. Um, some extra heating fuel and an emergency heating source such as a propane uh, heater, fireplace, etc. I want to make sure you have extra food for your pets, uh, water, shelter, basically everything they're going to need as well. In your vehicle, uh, really, really recommend a storm survival kit. Uh, we sell these at our store. Uh, they have them you know, online. You can find them around town. Uh, wherever you need to get one doesn't matter, but definitely make sure you pack one. Also recommend a shovel. Uh, to dig yourself out if you get stuck, but you know having maps in there in case your cell phone uh, dies, have an extra charger, maybe a solar powered one, some high calorie food, candles, uh, emergency blankets, some flares potentially, uh, tow rope or chain, 
um, you know, uh, jumper cables, gas line de-icer. Um, essentially, you just want to think like, hey, if I was stuck in this truck or this car for 36 hours, which is typically, you know, how long a long winter storm takes, you know, would I have enough to stay warm and, and, and stay alive? Definitely, you don't want to leave your vehicle, and we'll go over that in a little bit. So repairing your vehicle in, from a maintenance perspective, you want to make sure your antifreeze levels are in good shape. Uh, low antifreeze levels will, will freeze up your lines and, and kind of hurt your engine, but potentially cause you to break down. You want to make sure your battery is fully charged and good to go. It's not kind of on its last leg. Make sure your brakes are working well, your exhaust system is working well, there's no leaks, etc. You want to make sure your air filters are clear and your fuel line is clean. Um, any water uh, in your vehicle can cause problems. And definitely want to make sure that you always have at least half a tank of gas uh, during the winter season. Once again, if you get stranded, you don't want to be out of gas. Uh, also, heater and defroster, make sure they're working properly, and lights and hazard lights, specifically hazard lights um, as well. You want to uh, go ahead and ensure that those are working properly. Um, want to make sure your oil level's correct and the weight's right for winter months. Obviously, you want to change that during winter uh, if your vehicle needs that. Make sure your thermostat's working properly. You have enough de-icing windshield wiper fluid. It's really good, and it's not a bad idea to look into getting good winter tires. We're going to have better studs for... Um, for dealing with ice, etc., and, and keep your traction a lot better. Uh, for your house, I uh, don't want to forget that. Once again, you know, kind of mentioned it earlier. You know, make sure you got enough equipment. Um, eyeglasses, kind of a weird thing, but make sure that you know um, you've got enough if you got to stay inside for a long time. Paper plates, napkins, paper towels, sanitation, personal hygiene items. Um, you know, there's there's kits you can get to heat water in case your water heater goes down. Um, you just put it in the in the in a bucket of water and heat it up. Not a bad idea. All right, so if you are stranded inside or outside or inside of a vehicle, I'm going to give you a few different tips and tricks here. So if you're stranded outside, obviously the first thing you want to do is find shelter. Uh, try to stay dry and always cover all your exposed body parts. And that windshield uh, windshield chart that I showed you a little bit earlier. Um, really that, that, that frostbite is going to occur on any skin that's exposed. So making sure you have underlayers, gloves, etc. protect exposed skin. If there's no shelter available, um, you want to look at building a lean-to, and that's why it's a good idea to have a tarp in your vehicle as well or a large blanket, a windbreak or snow cave for protections from the wind. That's kind of your biggest danger when it's cold. Uh, build a fire for heat and to attract attention so people can find you. Um, place rocks around the tire to absorb and reflect the heat, around the fire rather. Uh, melt snow for drinking water and eating snow will lower your body temperature which could lead to hypothermia as well so you know you want to make sure that that's warm if you're stranded in a vehicle um, obviously you, you just get you're gonna hunker down and camp out there uh, you want to run the engine about 10 minutes each hour for heat you don't want to keep it running all the time because once again you don't want to uh, reduce your gas but you're definitely gonna want to keep the area around your exhaust pipe clear so that carbon monoxide doesn't come back through into the vehicle um, also open the window for a little fresh air. Uh, be visible to rescuers. Once again, a fluorescent flag or something of that nature uh, you want to have in there as well. Uh, turn on the dome light when running the engine. Uh, tie a bright colored cloth uh, to your antenna or door. Once again, a flag. Uh, if, the snow stops, if the snow stops falling, raise the hood to indicate you need help. Uh, it's not a bad idea. So and every once in a while you're going to want to get out, move arms, legs, fingers, and toes, keep blood circulating to keep warm. Uh, and with that, that and with the emergency survival kit, food, you know, heat blankets, etc., you should be in good shape. If you're working outside, one of the main things I want to talk about is not using a torch to thaw anything, especially if it has held or could hold um, hydrocarbons. Because a lot of guys out there, you know, on pumps, etc., they freeze up and they're using torches to, or weed burners to, to thaw them out. That will cause uh, essentially seals to, to melt and, and release gases, etc., um, so not a good method. Um, using antifreeze isn't a bad idea, methanol, things of that nature, but you definitely don't want to use uh, heat like that. So you want to plan your work effectively, uh, plan for and take frequent breaks. Uh, you definitely want to be eating a lot more and drinking a lot more water um, when, when it's cold outside to keep yourself hydrated. Um, and you don't want to be using a lot of caffeine, uh, minimal coffee or energy drinks. Some people say, you know, you can... Uh, uh, you know, use liquor to keep yourself warm. Uh, that, that may work for a few moments, but it's not going to work long term. So probably don't, you know, need a bottle of Jack in your winter survival kit. And you also want to ensure you have the proper PE, PPE for working outside. So winter gloves, thermally insulated boots. You want to dress in layers. Uh, underlayers are not required to be FR, so go ahead and feel free to you know, have some non-FR underwear. Uh, 
but you know as many layers as, as you can you can wear and stay comfortable hot hands or other hand or foot warming tools are good uh, make sure you have base layers uh, water wicking are good so it doesn't hold moisture hard hat liners to protect your neck from the wind uh, a lot of people wear hoodies under their hard hats when it's cold that's not an acceptable practice. You can get hard hat liners. You wanna make sure you have those. And also ensure heaters that you're using are intrinsically safe or designed with tip over protection if they don't need to be intrinsically safe so you don't start fires. All right, so getting into injuries a little bit and factors increasing risk of cold injuries and illnesses. Um, if you've had a previous cold related injury, you're at higher risk. Uh, predisposing health conditions, fatigue, poor physical condition, uh, not enough nutrition, dehydration, certain types of medication, alcohol and caffeine are big ones, nicotine even, um, age and proper clothing and equipment, underactivity or overactivity, and obviously cold conditions, low temperature, high wind, uh, moisture, and long-term exposure. These are kind of the bigger ones that are going to, that's why it's important to plan and take those breaks. Preventing cold-related injuries and illnesses, how do, we, how do we prevent them from happening? Once again, wear appropriate clothing. Uh, avoid wetness or excessive sweating unless you have you know wicking layers stay dry keep active uh, take frequent breaks in warm shielded areas from the wind especially uh, work in pairs so you can keep an eye on each other consume warm high calorie food often as often as possible i mean guys back in the day i'm um, thinking of lewis and clark and their crew when they came through north dakota when they first explored this area um, they those guys would eat like 10,000 calories a day uh, while they were working outside so just kind of keep that in mind um, hypothermia sets in when our body is unable to maintain a 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit temperature. And, you know, you can get cold and then warm back up and cold warm back up. But once that system breaks uh, or is broken, that's when your hypothermia is going to set in. And depending on how cold and for how long is going to, you know, determine how serious of an injury it becomes. So uh, the hypothalamus is really what's affected. Um, and you may not know it's happening to you. Um, you may think that, you know, you're just shivering can stop because your body's like, hey, this isn't working. We're going to I'm going to stop doing it. Um, so you also want coworkers around to help you identify that issue. So most uh, cases of hypothermia occur in air temperatures from 30 degrees to 40 degrees, believe it or not. Um, within that range where in North Dakota, a lot of guys are outside in T-shirts. Like, yeah, this is nice. Um, however, it can occur, occur as high as 65 degrees Fahrenheit, depending on how long you're exposed to that temperature. So um, generally in cold, dry environments, hypothermia occurs over a period of hours and cold water obviously can happen very quickly. We, we think about hypo, we tend to think hypothermia in terms of being in the water, but it can absolutely happen um, outside of water. So that's what we call immersion uh, hypothermia. And this is kind of a quick chart just to show you how quickly it can happen. So at 32 and a half degrees, I mean, you're talking, um, under 15 minutes, you're going to get exhaustion or unconsciousness and expected time of survival is really not great. 15 to 45 minutes. So kind of getting, um, water temperature, even up to 80 degrees, you know, you can be there for a long time, but 70 to 80, two and a half, two to 12 hours exhaustion or unconsciousness and expected time of survival, uh, three hours to indefinite. Once again, depends on the individual, previous injuries, medications, age, etc. But then even in that 40 to 50 degree range, you know, 30 to 60 minutes before you, you become unconscious and really only three hours of survival time. So, you know, if you're out there on the water for whatever reason, you know, kind of be aware of that. Stages of hypothermia. We start with mild, then we go to moderate and severe. And that's really it has a lot to do with core body temperature. So 98 to 95 degrees is where we're going to start to hit mild hypothermia, 95 to 90 moderate, and then below 90 where it's severe in a severe situation. So the signs of that, mild hypothermia will start there. Shivering, you know, you're going to start getting shivering, sensations of cold and pain in extremities, pale waxy cold skin, numbness of hands, unable to perform complex tasks, uh, able to walk and talk. You're going to start to get disoriented uh, and irritable as well. So if shivering can be stopped voluntarily, you're typically in mild hypothermia there. Possible death from hypothermia is when we get in that serious level, and that's when we're below 90 degrees, typically 82 to 78. So erratic shallow breathing, may not be able to feel pulse, pupils dilated and fixed, cold blue skin, unresponsive to stimuli, pulmonary edema, meaning your lungs are filling with fluid, cardiac and respiratory failure, and death. Um, so what's happening is our brain's slowing down, our hypothalamus is becoming inactive, and we start to go unconscious, our, our mind stops working, it's trying to preserve every ounce of energy to the body staying warm. So I had a treatment. In mild uh, uh, hypothermic uh, uh, 
situations. You want to remove wet clothes, move them to a warm environment. Do not exercise to warm them up. Uh, you don't want to rewarm them in a warm bath either or by massaging or rubbing because they may have frozen um, extremities especially and then that can cause some serious issues. So you want to drink warm um, sugary drinks, avoid drinks with caffeine however, and transport victim to emergency facility immediately. Uh, frostbite, um, a little bit different essentially once again those ice crystals are going to, and typically hypothermia and frostbite can be together, um, but essentially this is typically going to happen to your extremity, so all the areas in blue here. So over time, your body will decrease blood flow to conserve uh, warmth to your body, and then the cold will overtake um, the blood vessels in those extremities and once again turn them to ice. So legs, feet, arms, hands, nose, ears, etc. So it occurs when the deep layers of the skin and other body tissues actually freeze, and that's what's going to happen to the body. So once that happens, it does permanent damage. Um, you'll not be able to feel those extremities anymore. Um, sometimes they can fall off if they freeze and break. I mean, it's a pretty serious issue. So the causes are exposure to below freezing temperatures for prolonged periods of time. Uh, can occur in above freezing temperatures based on how much wind there is, and we looked at that earlier at the chart. Uh, contact with extremely cold so um, objects, usually metal is kind of one of the, the worst ones, and contact with cooled or compressed gases. It can happen in that, in that case as well. So there's two different ways to classify frostbite, superficial and deep. The extent of it depends on the extremeness of conditions and how long you're out there. Superficial frostbite um, includes all layers just of the skin, initially redness, um, burning, tingling, itching, or cold sensations. Um, skin turns white, waxy, some resistance, and then there may be a, even a little bit of blistering. Deep frostbite includes skin, muscle, tendons, nerve, blood vessels, and even the bone can, uh, can uh, be involved in deep frostbite. White or yellowish waxy skin, um, Sharon's blue as it thaws, underlying tissue is hard, no resistance when pressed, that's not good when it's not spongy anymore. Blood filled blisters and swelling may develop and even blood clots, so pretty serious there. So to treat frostbite, if you have it or a buddy has it, um, you don't want to leave them alone. Uh, give them to a dry, warm area, remove any wet or tight clothing, you want to get their skin. You know, you've seen people like pressing skin to skin. What's good about that is it kind of gets us to the right temperature, but not too fast. So it's kind of a slow warmth. Uh, do not rub the affected area because rubbing causes damage to the skin and tissue. And essentially, with, hypo with frostbite, unlike hypothermia, you can put them in a warm bath, but 105 degrees and monitor the water temperature. Um, you don't want to pour warm water directly on the affected area because it will warm the tissue too fast and can cause tissue damage as well. So it typically takes about 25 to 40 minutes to, to treat frostbite effectively. Um, so it may become puffy and blistery. Uh, this area, affected area may have a burning feeling or numbness. Uh, when normal feeling movement and skin color have returned, it should be dried and wrapped to keep it warm and just kind of unaffected. Um, so it can get cold again, or if it can get cold again, you want to make sure you leave it cold rather than warming it and getting it cold again, because once again, that's going to cause some serious damage. Frost nip is mild formus, or the mildest form of uh, winter injury. Happens to a lot of guys, a lot of us have experienced this. I mean, it, you, you occasionally occurs about 59 degrees Fahrenheit. You know, we don't have our ears covered yet. We're like, hey, it's not that cold. You get some wind going. Skin's going to turn a little bit uh, light or white. Uh, top layer of it feels hard, but uh, deeper tissue still feels normal. You're going to feeling, be feeling some tingling and numbness. Most of us have experiences. Happens to our feet a lot especially. It can be prevented by wearing warm clothing and footwear. If you do experience frost nip, you just want to gently rewarm the affected area by putting on a heater, uh, putting on a warmer part of the body. Do not use very hot objects such as hot water bottles. You know, once again, it's going to damage tissue because it's, it's vulnerable at that point. And you don't want to rub the part either. Ice, even small ice crystals in the tissue can cause damage if the skin is rubbed. So we don't want to put compression on it. We just want to warm it up slowly. So an immersion injury or trench foot uh, results to uh, results from long exposure to wet or damp cool conditions. So if that happens for whatever reason, you're walking through the snow, you don't have the right boots, once again, definitely invest in some good winter boots. Uh, from 32 to 50 degrees is where this typically occurs. It can occur uh, as high as 60 degrees. And, and you know, like uh, Vietnam, et cetera, trench foot uh, did occur. And essentially the primary injury is the nerve and muscle tissue. Um, there's no formation of ice crystals, but it can cause permanent damage nonetheless. So symptoms, reddened skin, tingling pain may cause permanent damage to the circulatory system um, and then may develop blisters, ulcers, and gangrene. In serious cases, amputation may be necessary. So treatment, that, treatment of this is obviously getting it dry as soon as possible, 
warming it slowly at room temperature, uh, carefully clean, dry, and wrapping loosely with sterile dressing. Uh, elevate feet to reduce the swelling. You want to reduce the amount of blood flow. Do not walk on that injured foot and then seek prompt medical attention. Uh, that's pretty serious. So prevention of this, uh, keeping feet clean and dry, uh, checking them regularly. If they get wet from water or sweat, dry them, replace with dry socks. Important to have some dry extra socks in your vehicle as well. I got a couple pairs in there at all times. Change, so change socks at least every eight hours or whenever wet and apply foot powder uh, with aluminum hydroxide can help. Don't wear tight socks. This can further impair circulation and don't sleep with wet socks ever. So that pretty much wraps up our, uh, our training for this month. Really appreciate you paying attention. Uh, once again, the uh, quiz is there. Now, one thing I did want to let you know about as well, um, some of you guys probably did this, but if you go to our Google page, if you type in Basin Safety and give a review um, of our training or any you know experience you've had with us or on Facebook, give a review. It you know highlights your name there. We actually will pick a winner at the end of the month or end of the year here in the next uh, two months, and we're giving away a Remington shotgun as well as some black gold uh, FR gear, so hoodie, uh, jeans, hat, etc. So definitely uh, put, put it out there. We'd like to hear from you, see how we're doing. And really thank you very much for uh, being a part of our training. Have a great month.